right, welcome back to the channel. We are moving right along with the 2022 OTB recap series. So after the World Open, which I featured a game in, in the last episode, I did play a small tournament, local club one. It was three rounds, nothing super eventful. My rating actually stayed exactly the same. Uh, but my next big plan tournament was in the middle of August. It was the 9th Washington International which is a big tournament, uh, USCF and FIDE rated, taking place right outside of Washington, D.C. in uh, Maryland. And uh, this tournament, I was playing in the under 2350 section, basically, although uh, the highest rated players, there wasn't anyone over like 2250. Um, and I will show you an interesting game, the most interesting perhaps that I played from it. I actually started off Losing the first game to a 1900, it was a rough start for me. But then I managed to bounce back and win four straight, including uh, a win against a master. Where I managed to uh, fend off his attack and, and come out uh, up material and converted. Then I lost to a 2150, who eventually finished second place. Won a game, then lost a very uh, disappointing round eight game, where I just decided to play like an opening, which... I had no business really playing to kind of throw off my opponent. It backfired. So going into this final round game, I was on five points out of eight. Uh, a little bit disappointed, but looking to still finish strong. I was paired up against the number three seed in the section, an international master from uh, Nigeria originally, with a peak rating, uh, peak FIDE rating, somewhere in the 2300s, peak USCF. Uh, high, I believe high 2300s as well. Uh, so obviously formidable opponent. His current USCF rating was just over 2200. FIDE just over 2000, but obviously like very experienced player. And the interesting thing is I had actually played him in Blitz a bunch of times uh, within the last year before this game, and I had never lost. But he had also never played his like main stuff against me. And with White... He likes to play the King's Indian attack, beginning with Knight F3. Um, but I don't really allow the King's Indian attack because I play D6. So I was trying to figure out before the game, what is he going to do? Is he going to play D4 and play some kind of maybe like a Torre attack? Something He had played something similar to this against me in Blitz. Uh, or is he going to go more for a King's Indian attack? And that's what he decided to do. Uh, and this is kind of how I like to play against it. And I was wondering if he would play something like knight d2 here, which is, strictly speaking, the most consistent with the King's Indian attack, where white will play e4. Obviously it looks weird against this setup, because usually black will go for some like d5 and c5 type thing. But this is a possibility. But he decides to play c4, and basically this transposes into an English, like a reverse Sicilian English opening. And... What I like to play against the English <clears throat> is I have basically a pet system, which is kind of like a reversed Grand Prix attack. And that is very much encapsulated in the move Queen E8. Because my plan is to swing the Queen to H5 and oftentimes play F4, Bishop H3, and be very aggressive. Go for a kingside attack. One of the ways that White can sort of counter that is with the move that he played bishop g5 like if white wants to just strictly focus on their own plan they can play b4 here or or rook b1 but he played bishop to g5 basically saying that i at any moment could take your knight which is a key piece that could be used in your attack and anyway the bishop it's not really clear what it's going to do like white may want to trade it off and then play e3 uh, and so when he plays bishop g5 i play c6 because one idea is he could take the knight and then put his knight on d5, and I don't really want to allow that. And now he plays b4, and uh, this is a position that I've still been pretty familiar with, having played it in blitz before. I played h6 here, basically asking him what he's going to do with his bishop. Now, if he takes my knight, which is a perfectly viable way to go, he's again going to have to be very careful here, because if white just plays kind of lazily rook b1, this is already a big blunder. Because in this position, do you see what I should play? 
I have the move e4. And this creates a double attack where I hit both knights. And actually, white is just losing a piece now. Like, he, he maybe gets one pawn for it, but he's going to be in really bad shape. So he would have to play queen c2. Uh, and then the game would continue, something like this. But he decided to go all the way back to c1. And he played it pretty quickly, which kind of surprised me. I thought, if anything, maybe going back to d2 makes more sense. But he went back to c1. I was like, okay, interesting. I just continue with my plan, develop the bishop. And he goes rook b1. So he's basically saying... I'm going to go for that same plan of uh, attacking the queen side, which is typically what white wants to do. But I'm not going to give up my bishop. And already, in anticipation of him playing b5, I decided to play a6, so that uh, I'm kind of fighting for the b5 square. If he plays b5, I can take and open up my rook. He goes a4. He's, again, playing fast. The time control for this tournament was an hour uh, and 40 minutes with a 30-second increment, and he had... Built up three minutes on his clock, just off based off the increment by this point. I played knight d7 now, and he goes for it. He goes b5. So at this point, uh, it's pretty clear he wants to open up the line for the rook. He wants to kind of create some weaknesses. But I, having studied this position a bit, knew that the plan for black to counter this is to strike back in the center with the move d5. And probably I should have taken once on b5 first, just to open up the rook and kind of liquidate one of my pawns, which later becomes a bit of a weakness. But I decided to just play d5 right away. And he took. And I decided to take with the pawn just to keep the piece on the board because I have more space and I have a very formidable pawn center. And he now plays, uh, he, he takes on a6. And here he played an interesting move, a5. I thought during the game that he would play d4 and once i play e4 put a knight on e5 and i thought this might be a bit annoying the computer says that this is just good for me because you know i have a big space advantage i block out his bishop and at some moment i can even take the knight and then the pawn becomes weak on e5 i thought this might be a bit annoying but he won for a different plan he played a5 clearing a square for his knight and to me it, it seemed like there's only one move i can play here and that is to play d4, right? Because he allowed it. He allowed me to push into his territory and gain a little bit of space. And then I can put my knight on d5. And again, this felt very natural to me. I didn't have to spend much time uh, thinking about it. And my point is that if at some moment he tries to move this knight, well, he has to watch out for me infiltrating the c3 square, which I now control with the help of the pawn. Uh, he decides to go bishop d2, which maybe the bishop should have been there to begin with, but... Uh, here is where I began to really think because we're clearly out of the opening. We're in the middle game now, and I'm trying to figure out what do I actually want to do? How am I going to improve the position from this point? Like, obviously, I have a nice center, but where do I take it from here? And what I decided to play was the move bishop to f6. My idea was that I support the pawn on d4 for a potential e4 push, which if I can get that through, then I'm just going to be kind of steamrolling him down the center. Plus, I was also thinking of some ideas with, like, g5 and, and obviously going for an attack. And I thought that the bishop would be in pretty good position to help out with this. He responded with e3, another quick move. But it seemed pretty clear what he was trying to do. He's trying to break up my pawn center and say that you can't just go e4 because now I'm just going to take here. And, you know, if the problem is if I push up too far but then I lose control, my center just crumbles and he's going to have a field day just kind of exploiting my weaknesses. So I decide to take and take. And this is kind of the early critical moment of the game. Uh, I knew that my position is still you know, fairly good. I, I felt like the position is right around equal at this point, and the engine agrees. But where do I go from here? And my plan was still kind of to try to go for some kind of a kingside attack because... All my pieces are kind of over there, and I have the potential to maybe pawn storm. And so I considered a few options here. The first being queen h5, because, you know, that's one of the plans of having the queen uh, on e8. But then I thought he just goes back with the knight, and do I want to trade queens? Not particularly, so then I just have to go back. So that doesn't seem great. Maybe the queen could be okay on f7, where it kind of connects with the bishop, but I also have to watch out for getting on the f-file, and he could attack me at some point. I thought about e4, just kind of pushing right down the center. 
but I wasn't so sure. Um, in the game, I actually only considered 91 for some reason, which this position is actually good for me because he has just a weir very weak pawn in e3 that I can attack. But he would, of course, put his knight on d4, which I somehow didn't consider, and a bunch of trades would happen. Uh, this is a pretty nice move by white, where if I take on d2, he takes on d5, and uh, position is right around equal. He has the bishop pair. I have an aggressive pawn on e3. It's a little bit hard to evaluate, but this would have been oh, okay to go for. Um, really, the best move in this position I could have played, which is one that I didn't really consider, but that's rook to d8. Just involving the rook into the game. The d file could be very useful because he has this kind of weak pawn on d3. But I ended up playing the move queen to g6 because I felt like the queen would be okay here. At some moment, maybe I play f4 and have some pressure down the g file. Queen could open up and attack d3. But then he played knight to b6. And the more I thought about it, the more I really started to dislike my last move because. Now my rook is under attack. I kind of want to take the knight. I mean, I could play rook a7. This is what I considered at first. But then I realized there's a big problem with this move. And it has a lot to do with where I just put my queen. He has a very nasty trick here. He can take the knight. And in this position, play the move knight takes e5. And suddenly I'm hit with a double attack. Bishop is hit and the queen is hit. So I can take the knight. But he takes my bishop a check, he just won a pawn, and things are starting to go downhill from here. So I felt like I should take the knight, and uh, it's kind of hard to decide which knight to take with. Do I take with the knight on d5 and the knight on d7? Engine claims that this knight would have been better to take with, but this seemed really scary to allow the pawn to get to b7, and uh, if the queen drops back, he can play e4 now. So I decided to take with this knight. And then play rook b8. But yeah, he played b7. And I again, I really didn't like my position at this point. Because I was like, what the what was the point of putting the queen on g6? Not doing anything over there. He has a pass pawn one square away from queening. Granted, I do have it blockaded. But that rook is now basically out of the game. And he's going to pretty soon start to put pressure. So I decided here to drop the queen back to f7. Because I felt like I needed to regroup somehow. And maybe try to go after the pawn. But he now plays bishop b4, hitting the rook and threatening to basically come to d6 to attack the rook on b8, so I have to block. Uh, Engine was actually saying that my best move is already to give up the exchange here. That's how bad things are. And basically play this position, just down exchange. You know, two bishops against bishop and rook. Of course, I didn't consider that. I just played bishop b7. And uh, he could have already traded here and... It still would have been pretty good for him, but he went back to c3 to hit the pawn on e5, and I played bishop to d6, which actually turned out to be another mistake. I thought that this is good for me because, well, I just kind of repositioned my bishop, and now he doesn't have bishop b4 anymore. Turns out I actually needed to go back to f6 because of his next move, which hit me pretty hard. He played the move knight h4. And now I was really in a world of pain because I realized that my whole position is just like hanging by a thread. Now he hits the pawn on f5, he opens up the rook, and his plan is very simple. He's going to play either g4 or e4, attack this pawn on f5, and I have to be super careful here. Not to mention that his bishop is also open. Uh, yeah, I was really not happy at this point. I felt like I'm just getting totally outplayed right now like these last couple moves the trend is very much not in the direction that I was hoping for but you know I have to try to survive somehow I play the move g6 and I was already kind of scared he was going to do something like this and force me to play f4 and then you know his bishop opens maybe I have some counterplay with like g5 but this looked really scary he instead blitzes out d4 Basically, kind of like a different way to try to attack my overextended pawns. But basically, I have to take. Because if I go e4, I mean, I can't even play that move because there's the pin. So I pretty much am forced to take. And here he makes his first mistake by almost immediately taking back with the pawn, which actually turned out to be 
of the three possibilities the worst one. He really should have taken with the queen. Now, this looks really good at first because it actually threatens mate on h8, but what he probably saw, just like I did, is that I can block with bishop e5. So then you think, oh, okay, if I just get easily blocked, then it must not be so great. But it turns out that he can just go back, and it's still not so clear what I'm going to do, because if I trade the bishops, he still controls the long diagonal, he still has e4 coming, and I don't really have too many obvious moves. Like, I'm, I'm constantly watching out to get attacked somehow. The g6 pawn is weak. If I play queen g7 to reinforce the bishop, he can just play rook c1, and I'm essentially just paralyzed with this rook. Like, he's going to eventually kind of hone in on the queen side, and I'm in trouble. But he took back with the pawn, which uh, was not the best, because now I'm able to get a little bit of time to sort of regroup. I played bishop c4, which was a nice move to attack his rook, and he decided to move it out of the way. And now I play knight to f6. I'm trying to improve my pieces somehow, and sort of like blockade him from getting an attack in. I obviously want to keep the b7 pawn under control. If I can block out his bishop and win the pawn, then obviously that would be great for me. He now plays the move rook b6, which is a nice move, activating the rook and suddenly introducing some pressure along the 6th rank. I can't simply just go back with the bishop because he can even play rook c6. Um, well, at least that's what I thought during the game. I missed that. I could just go bishop b5 here and kind of be okay. Um, but I played rook to d8, thinking that this would be good. I just defend the bishop and... Um, you know, the rook wasn't doing anything on f8 anyway. Turns out that this was a mistake, and this actually allowed him another big opportunity, which he, luckily for me, did not take. He thought for a few minutes and played queen c1, but in this position, he actually had a devastating move he could have played, which I guess we both overlooked, and that is the move d5. Just kind of subtle-looking pawn break, but the point is that, once again... He's opening up the diagonal, and this is going to be a problem for me because uh, I can't play bishop c5 because then this knight hangs. I mean, even if I take that rook, the fact that his rook invades, you know, my king space is going to spell big trouble. And if I take the pawn, he goes queen d4, and I have no way to protect this diagonal. Like, if I go king h7, he can just pick off my bishop. Uh... What else can I do? I mean, if I play bishop takes d5, he takes here, and I'm losing something because my rook is under attack, my bishop is under attack, everything's hanging. Bishop b5 is like the only move really worth considering because it gets the bishop out of the way, but queen d4 still comes. And in this position, okay, it's not so easy to find how white wins, but he would have had the crushing move here, rook takes f5. And this is just devastating because... He gives up a rook, but he's going to win the bishop now on d6. And after that, the knight is going to hang. Like, my entire position just totally collapses. And, uh, I mean, props to him if he were to have found that. But he didn't. He played queen c1, just kind of attacking the pawn on h6. I moved my king just to defend it. And I should mention that by this point, we're on move 31. He still has over an hour. He has like an hour and maybe 10 minutes. And I had just about 25 minutes or so. So I obviously had spent a lot of time trying to find good defensive moves throughout. And uh, there's no bonus time during this this tournament. Like, you don't get an additional time after 40 moves. So I have to be very diligent with my time management. Uh, he played bishop D2 to d2 here, trying to again attack the h6 pawn. Again, it turns out he had the sacrifice, uh, which looks ridiculous, but it's actually very strong because... He just needs to rip open the position, and, like, my king is very hard to defend. Um, granted, like, some of these lines are a little bit computery. They're not easy for a human to find, um, you know, and, and keep the attack going. He just played bishop to d2. I played knight to g4 now, attacking his rook, defending the pawn on h6. Um, could have also played bishop d5, and this actually would have been a little bit more accurate. But... This prompted him to play a very interesting move. He played rook f4, basically offering uh, the rook. 
I can take it with the bishop, but I don't want to because if I do, then his bishop lands on f4. Now he attacks the rook, and I mean, this is it doesn't take a genius to see that I, I really shouldn't take the rook. Uh, he actually needed to sacrifice the exchange a different way. He could have played bishop f4, let me take on f2, but taken on d6, and this actually would have been much better for him. Because now this bishop is very active. Uh, I can save my knight, but... I mean, again, there, there's some variations here which are very complicated, but very difficult for me to navigate with like such a passive rook sitting on b8. So he plays rook f4. And I started to really come back into the game here. I played the move bishop to d5. Blocking his bishop off the diagonal, basically just offering to trade. And as soon as that happens, the pawn on b7 is just falling. Actually, he is pretty much out of ways to defend it. So he brings his rook back to f1. And I just pick up the pawn on b7. Uh, I mean, he takes my pawn on a6, but whose pawn was more valuable? Obviously his, right? So... I'm very happy now I can breathe a sigh of relief that I no longer have to watch over the pass pawn. And now I can start to turn the game around. I play rook c7, hitting his queen. Uh, he has to duck out of the way. He decides to trade on d5 first, which might not have been such a great idea because now my queen just gets to centralize and he still has to move his queen. And he starts to lose a thread because he, instead of ducking off to the side where his queen is not going to get attacked again, he puts it on b2, and guess what? I attack it again. And already at this point, I saw a possibility of a little tactical sequence that I could uncork to really turn the game in my favor. And I was just hoping that I get a chance to execute. Uh, and he plays queen c3 here. And I go rook b3. Attacking his queen. And I realize that at this point, he's going to do this. He's going to attack my queen right back. And, and basically, he's fine with the queen trade. Because in this position, maybe I'm slightly better, but not as much as in this position where I have a dominant queen on d5. He has this weak pawn on d4. And his king is a little bit less safe than mine is. So he goes rook a5, but I just go back with the queen. Because I'm obviously trying to keep the queens on the board. And in this position, he made the decisive error of the game. He needed to play the move, which I saw, and that is rook a7. The only way to basically keep the queens on the board, because he attacks my queen, and because of uh, the pin I have to take, he's then going to take my rook, I can take the pawn with check, and I'm going to be up a pawn, but it's not so clear still, because I do actually have to watch out for the queen on coming to f7, in which case it would be mate. Like, let's say I play some random move. He actually has mate in two. So I obviously can't allow that. Like, I can check him and his knight has to go back, but there's still work to be done here. Instead, though, he just uh, is totally oblivious to the danger. He plays queen c4 immediately. And that allowed me to play the move, which I had been hoping that I would get the opportunity to play. But before I reveal it, you can feel free to pause and see what should black play in this position. So there's a couple kind of ideas, all of which are good. But the strongest one is the move bishop takes g3. Where I basically just sack my bishop, but he actually can't even take it. Because if he does, he quite simply gets mated. Because my knight is in such a strong position, and with the rook coming in and the queen angling, he just gets checkmated. So he can't take. So he's just realizing like, whoa. He already knew his position was bad. Now he realizes that he's in big trouble. He circles back with the knight, allowing me to take another pawn with check. And then uh, now I knew I'm winning, but by this point I had just about 10 minutes left. He still has more than 30. So he's just playing quick now, trying to hope that you know I mess up somehow along the way. But, I mean, the advantage is tremendous at this point. I'm, I'm crushing. I just have to figure out how to finish him off. Like, rook h3 was one possibility. Uh, but there was something I didn't like about it. Um, even though the computer says that it's like, I don't know, made in 15 or something crazy. I played rook g3 instead. Basically attacking the knight on g2. I knew he was going to play d5, blocking the diagonal. And now I played rook h3. And my point is that I provoked him to open 
this diagonal, and then I'm going to swing my bishop onto it. So he goes rook b5, attacking my queen, but I go bishop back, check, and then I swing the bishop here. And he is just totally exposed on this diagonal. He either has to sack the rook, or he has to block, which he chose to do, and I basically just get a free piece. Like, again, Engine was saying that I could have, I had like mate in 12 or something, I had like a forced way to mate. In the situation that I was in, like seven, eight minutes, clock ticking down, you know, nervous, not trying to mess up a big win against a strong player, I just kind of decided, let me just take the piece and simplify, like mitigate all risk. He goes king g2 here, I go queen b8, trying to swing my queen towards the king side. He, of course, covers, um, and I have to be careful not to allow any checks. But in this position, I found a pretty nice way to simplify down into the end game that I was hoping to get. I played g5. He basically is forced to like offer a queen trade because if he moved his queen anywhere else, he's basically getting mated. Like he has to watch over the g3 square. But now I'm able to trade and I have this check, which allows me to win the rook. And now it's just over because, you know, I'm up not only a piece, but two pawns. And uh, even though he takes this one, you know, I played out a couple quick moves. He's like obviously trying to blitz and, and keep me under pressure. But at this point, it's simple enough. Check. I force the king out of the way. And after I block his one check from the back, he finally resigns because, again, I'm up, you know, too many pawns. I'm just going to queen one of them and one rook is not going to be enough to put up a fight. So, yeah, very tumultuous game. Started off well, but then I was really in trouble for a, a period there in the middle game. Like, I really thought I was just going down, uh, sinking fast once he, like, found knight h4 and I was, like, under big pressure. But he kind of misplayed it. He missed some tactical moments. And I managed to win, finishing the tournament on 6 out of 9. I tied for third place, I believe. There were a couple other people that finished with 6. So, yeah, won a little bit of money. Gained about 20 rating points. So it was a fairly successful tournament. Um, and the uh, biggest thing was I managed to cross 2100 again after kind of being in a slump for a period of time. But yeah, that is all for this video, and I will catch you again for the tournaments that I played in September of 2022.